Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video here on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and as always, today's questions, all five pages of them, have been brought to you by the uh, patrons, uh, who are the folks who help support Forgotten Weapons and keep it happening. While I'm on that subject, just briefly, I should mention I have been uh, perhaps remiss in uh, bringing it up recently, but we do still have all four versions of the Secret Weapons of World War One. Uh, design uh, available in the merchandise shop both as awesome shirts and as awesome posters if you'd like to have something to hang on the wall. So there's a link in the description text below to uh, take you to that shop. If you're interested in that sort of thing, check it out. Anyway, let's move on and get right into our first question. It's from Andrew, who says, Why wasn't the Berthier style of sight used on other rifles? Or if it was, what on? Well, it wasn't really used on much else, um, although once we get to like the, the Moss 44 and 49 and 4956, they are using something kind of similar because the sights are relatively large, um, although it is an aperture at that point instead of a notch. What Andrew is talking about is in the middle of World War I, the French actually revised the iron sights on the Berthier and also the Lebel rifles and went from a very narrow front post to a very wide one that was better for snap shooting and better for low light. I suspect that the reason that didn't survive after the war and why it wasn't adopted by other countries is because it almost certainly hurt marksmanship scores on the like the basic known distance practice range, and that was absolutely the place that most militaries judged their rifles. Um, and so you'll see it over and over with uh, American sites, for example, they always get the thing that does the best on the practice range, even if that's not necessarily the best for actual combat. So it, I think it's really remarkable that the French even were willing to make that change during World War I. Um, that is, to me, surprising just by itself. The fact that nobody else did it is kind of what I would expect. Next question is from Matthew, who says, I've been trying to find a book that covers the history of small arms used by the United States. Do you have any suggestions? I have to say I don't, really. Um, when it comes to my library, I'm always looking for books that go really as deep into detail as possible, and that generally means you're looking at just one specific gun or one specific time period. For me, the books that cover a wide range of guns, for example, something that would cover the history of all American small arms, are going to be uh, too, too high level. They're not going to cover enough detail on any of those guns to be particularly interesting to me. Now, if you are interested in a little bit narrower of a focus, um, Bruce Canfield has some books out there on American arms of World War I and World War II, American combat shotguns, and those seem to be quite good, uh, but they don't really cover everything. So honestly, I kind of deliberately ignore the books that cover too much too, that are too broad because they're not deep enough, so I don't have a good suggestion. Perhaps someone else does, and they can uh, let us know down in the comments. Uh, third question is from James. What is your take on the 4.85mm British cartridge? How would things have gone if NATO had adopted that instead of SS-109? Honestly, I think it's just fine. Um, it's another one of those cartridges like the the uh, persistent rash of, of 5.56 replacement cartridges that we still see today, where it's probably within 5% better or worse than 5.56. Um, would, it have, would it really change anything as a practical matter to swap to any of these other cartridges that are right in the same sort of class? No, probably not. Um, 4.85 is going to be a little bit lighter. It's also going to be a little bit less effective, I suspect, certainly on barriers. Um, I don't think it would have made a big difference either way. The British certainly would have liked it, though, I suspect. Uh, Thomas says, I'm currently working on an alternative history project imagining what a PMC, a uh, private military company, uh, similar to the infamous Blackwater unit in the interwar and or postwar period would have looked like. What do you think the weapons of choice would have been for a private close protection agency in the 1920s to 1940s? That's a really interesting uh, conceptual question. Uh, a big part of that's going to come down to where you are geographically. If we assume the United States, I think you would see, I think for handguns you would see mostly Colts. Some guys in such a unit 
would probably like to keep older pattern double action revolvers, but I think as a general rule you would be looking at 1903 pocket hammerless and 1911 service pistols. Uh, for example, we can see that with uh, the Shanghai Municipal Police. Um, that's exactly what they ran, and, and because those were the high-end combat uh, handguns of that period, concealable and combat guns, Colt was an extremely good manufacturer at that point, great reputation, you're not going to go wrong with those things. Um, and there weren't really any high capacity, there weren't any really good high capacity pistols on the market. That really predates the Browning High Power, so that wouldn't have shown up on the scene yet. Um, as far as, well there's also a possibility if you're looking especially at concealable pistols, the other big options out there for an American uh, would have been uh, Remington 51s and Savage Automatics. Uh, those were also popular overseas. If you were in Europe, you might also be looking at things, you know, it really comes down to every individual country, but um, the Sauer pistols, uh, the Sauer 1913 would have been a good choice for someone. Uh, when it comes to submachine guns, I think in the United States the Thompson would have been the submachine gun of choice, despite all of its limitations. If you look more internationally, um, there were a lot of Bergman submachine guns in use. They were manufactured and sold commercially all over the globe. So you'll see Bergmans in South America, you'll see Bergmans in Asia, in Europe, all over, you know, all, all different areas of Europe. Um, the Bergman is basically a copy of the German MP18 converted to use uh, box magazines, so those, those would stand a good chance of showing up. Uh, rifles, I think if you're talking about an American group, the BAR, um, again Colt was selling BARs on the commercial market, and they were like the really fancy, high-end, uh, prestigious thing for uh, for corporate labor relations, such as they were in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, for law enforcement, you see the FBI actually adopting the BAR, uh, the monitor pattern of the BAR as its official fighting rifle, or one of them. Uh, you would also see for smaller, just semi-automatic rifles, the two main contenders would have been the Remington Model 8 and the Winchester 1907 or 1910, depending on did you want the, the simpler, slightly less powerful one, or did you want the more complex, more powerful one? That would be the Remington 8. Um, not a whole lot that comes to mind for self-loading rifles over in Europe um, at this point. Um, I think even over in Europe they would have been looking at, at those two self-loaders. Um, they were Again, these were guns that were sold worldwide, not just in the United States. So that's what I would be looking at. If, you, uh, if this PMC has Heavier weapons, you would definitely have Maxim guns. There's a potential, if you want to make it a little bit different, uh, for them to have Colt 1895 machine guns. Um, that would have been one of the other commercial guns out there worldwide and also in the United States. So um, the Colt's advantage is it's an air-cooled gun, so the whole package is going to be lighter. The Maxim, of course, is going to be a, a much better gun for serious sustained fire. Interesting question. That's kind of a cool period, a cool thing to look at. Uh, next up is Joe, who says, what gun do you dislike the most? Not counting the Cobra Terminator, of course. The answer is the Cobra Terminator. Uh, there are very few guns that I like actively dislike, and that is by far the worst of them. Um, if I never shoot one of those things, if I never have to look at one of those things again, it'll be too soon. Uh, Ilya says, before modern technologies, how did people figure out the rate of fire um, and the velocity of firearms and ammunition? Uh, well, we can break that into two parts. Velocity is actually pretty easy to, to determine. Um, if you get a pendulum, you know the weight of the pendulum, you know the weight of your bullet, you shoot a bullet into the pendulum, you measure how far the pendulum goes, uh, you can then calculate the amount of energy it takes to move that pendulum that far, you then are able to divide out the weight of the bullet, and presto, you are left with the velocity of the bullet. So that one was has always been relatively simple without any fancy technology. As far as rate of fire, there were high-speed cameras going back, boy, into World War II and before. They're not quite cameras the way we think of them today, in that they don't necessarily record a moving picture that you can just look at. However, they were absolutely the equivalent of high-speed cameras for recording discrete data points. And the way a lot of that sort of thing will work, and in fact the simplest way to, to find, uh, find rate of fire if you don't have a like an accurate stopwatch, which by the way is a way to do it, especially with something like a belt-fed gun, 
you, know, you can accurately measure the time it takes to fire, say, a hundred rounds, and divide that out by a hundred. If you're trying to, you know, fire a five-round burst and get an accurate rate of fire, well, one way to do it is set up a spool of paper on on two rotating uh, dowels and power them, so you know you know how fast uh, your your paper is is being rolled and unrolled. You can then calculate. Uh, you, you fire a burst into the paper and you look at the bullet holes, and they're going to be spaced a discrete amount of distance apart. If you know how fast the paper is traveling, you can then calculate uh, how often the bullets are hitting the paper. And uh, people would use that as sort of an early high-speed camera technology as well. If you do that with film, and you have, for example, a hole cut in a very specific point on a firearm, and a light shining through it, you can actually track uh, where that, that piece of the gun is moving at any, you know, as a discreetly through the, the cycle of firing. And so what you would do, you don't have like video footage to sh where you can watch, for example, the bolt moving, but you can set this up for discrete data points and say, what is my bolt velocity? Uh, when does the bolt stop? How does it accelerate or decelerate through the firing cycle? And, and those are all things that can be uh, measured and, and uh, observed through this early sort of high-speed camera type of technology. Next question is Hunter. It says, why was rimfire a thing used almost solely for rounds that were low pressure or manually cycled rifles, rounds like the 44 Henry? Is it inherently weaker to design a cartridge as a rimfire? Does it affect reliability of ignition? Or is it just a concept that mostly fell for the wayside for no real reason? A uh, combination of a couple of those. First off, the rimfire is generally less reliable than centerfire. Uh, with the Henry in particular, and some other guns, you would see designers using two firing pin points on a, a breech face instead of just one to increase the reliability of uh, detonation. The problem you get with rimfire is the way it's typically manufactured is you'll spin a cartridge case uh, and drop uh, liquid primer component, primer material, into the base of the cartridge, and then rely on centrifugal force to spin it out into the rim. And if you don't quite have enough, you might have pockets in that rim that don't have enough primer com uh, compound to actually ignite when they're struck. So yeah, it is less reliable. The reason that you only see it in these types of guns, however, is because it was invented before the center fire primer was invented. And at the same time, people are also working on developing better and stronger locking systems. And it just happens that the, the beginning of the repeating rifles tended to coincide with the period when the best primer technology out there was rimfire. As people develop better locking systems, they're also inventing the center fire cartridge, and the center fire is more reliable than rimfire. Uh, it's also reloadable, which rimfire is not, and so people tend to want to go to center fire and they're getting better guns at the same time. That's Those are the two main reasons why rimfire goes away. Uh, it's less reliable, it's not reloadable. So we still see it in 22 because the 22 rimfire is manufactured in such massive quantities and it has become such a universal cartridge that it still makes sense uh, to load it. And nobody, it, it's cheap enough that nobody's really worried about trying to reload 22 rimfire. Uh, page number two. Aaron says, I read an article recently where the author, a Special Forces soldier, talks about the rifle being used more as a personal defense weapon than a primary weapon system. Since the Vietnam era, that seems to be largely true. Are there any periods of time prior to the present day where the weapon issued to soldiers was not really used as a primary weapon system? Uh, yes, extensively. Not, not always everybody in the army, but for example, artillery crews were virtually always issued some sort of firearm, uh, whether it's you know a Luger with a stock, uh, for the Germans in World War I, or carbines from um, basically every army ever, uh, those, those artillery crew small arms were never really meant to be used. The artillery crew should be focusing on running their artillery piece, and they should never be in a situation where they're actually in direct small arms combat with the enemy. But you know there's a good chance that that will happen at some point, and you don't want the crews to be completely unarmed, so everybody issues crews weapons. That's often why they got carbines. They weren't expected to be fighting at full infantry ranges, and their gun is secondary to their real job, so you want to give them something that's a little bit lighter and handier if possible. Uh, so yeah, for as long as there have been crew-served weapons, there have been small arms that were really only supposed to be emergency-use personal defense weapons. 
Uh, next up, Mads says, uh, have you heard about the Winchester 1917 Model D? And if so, do you think this version could have become a success on the military market? So the 1917 Model D is basically the US Model 1917 Enfield rifle manufactured in other cartridges for export. Uh, Winchester started making this rifle in 303 British for the British uh, as the pattern 1914, and it was a great rifle, and the British bought a lot of them. And then they tooled up to make it in 30 6 for the US military, where it was uh, accounted actually for the majority of US rifles in World War I. Uh, Winchester attempted to sell this thing to the Russians in 762 by 54 rimmed, but that, uh, that didn't go anywhere. Um, I think the Russians ended up going with. Uh, the the uh, 1895 lever action rifle, simply because it was already in production, I think they were promised something better. Uh, well, pro they were they were promised better uh, delivery dates and times, and I think that was actually before Winchester made this attempt to sell them uh, the 1917 uh, pattern guns. So could it have been successful? Yeah, I think it was a great rifle. I would love the 1917 Enfield uh, or the 19. Yes. It's hard to describe. In the US it's M1917, the British it's the Pattern 14 Enfield. Anyway, the problem with it from an export perspective is it's basically a Mauser with an aperture sight. So a lot of militaries didn't really, didn't necessarily see a lot of value in the aperture sight. I think we do today to a much greater extent than they did then. And why would you get that when you could just go buy a Mauser? And of course, by this point, everyone, you know, Winchester's not going to have a lot of people it can export to during World War One, and after World War One, there's a lot of surplus small arms floating around, and the the possibility of selling anybody any military rifles that are brand new is going to be a bit more difficult. So uh, Winchester ended up scrapping the idea. It may not have been a particularly cost-effective rifle for them to make on the commercial market. Uh, that I don't know about, but for whatever reason. They didn't pursue this after World War One, uh, certainly not successfully. But yeah, it could have been a really cool rifle. Uh, give me a a 1917 Model D and like 6.5 Swede. That would be really a slick gun or seven millimeter Mauser. That'd be a nice rifle. Matthew says, "What is the single most underrated development of the 21st century?" I don't know about underrated, but I'd say probably the single most important is information technology. Um, we live in a world today where if someone is, understands how to do it and is willing to put in the resources to do it, you could you could circumvent the entire requirement of having a war um, and basically achieve any military type goal through information technology instead. And it is worrisome that we don't pay as much attention to that as we really should. The the potential implications of the internet information sharing, information access, and social media, and the new abilities we have to communicate with people, there are just almost unimaginable implications of those, and we are barely starting to scratch the surface on how to the damage they can do, the opportunities they present, and how we can best use them responsibly. Uh, Tyler says, who are the team behind Forgotten Weapons? Well, uh, you're looking at it. <laughs> Uh, there are some people who occasionally help me. Obviously, Carl. Um, Carl and I do in range together. Uh, Carl helps out from time to time when we happen to be in the same place uh, doing filming. Um, I also, when I'm traveling, I will often wrangle someone that I'm uh, that I happen to be visiting to help me. Uh, if, especially if we're out on a shooting range, it's helpful to have someone else getting uh, helping me set up good camera angles. Um, that's a lot easier than setting up a tripod and then going back in front and making sure that the, the angle's good and the field of view is good. You'll notice from time to time, especially when I'm shooting, there are camera angles that kind of are messed up, like, oh, the muzzle's not quite all the way in frame. Um, the OVP 1918 video is like that. And often my, my time availability is tight to do video, and if I don't have a second person helping me get camera angles, I occasionally end up with not quite perfect shots like that. At any rate, beyond those two situations, this is all a one-man operation. So I do all the research, I don't script anything, um, I do take notes in advance almost all the time just to help get things set in my head. I do all the social media, I do all the posting, all the editing, all the... you name it, it's me. So. Uh, Colin says, on old rifles with built-in sights and fixed ranges, how are the sights and their placement designed so that ranges would be accurate? 
uh, combination of engineering know-how, trial and error, and math. So just uh, if you know a muzzle velocity and you know a ballistic coefficient of a bullet, you can calculate how much it's going to drop at any given range, and people have been able to do that math for quite a long time. Uh, you can then design sights that have the correct adjustments to match those bullet characteristics. And then you design it, you build it, you take it out in the field and test it. And uh, if, if you didn't quite get it right for whatever reason, maybe you didn't quite estimate the BC of the bullet correctly, uh, then you make adjustments and fix it and put the thing into production. I think it's also important to point out that especially at the longer ranges, those sights are generally intended for multiple people firing at once, and basically in volleys, and it's not really necessarily meant to automatically get a dead-on bullseye. That's, that was the goal, but I think the, the requirement, the, the tolerance on those were a bit looser than you might expect today. Next up from Nicholas says, your job seems pretty awesome. I think I'm sure most of us think we would love to have it. What's the worst part of it? And what hidden challenge or difficulties are we overlooking? And is it editing all the videos? Um, editing is one of my less favorite things to do. Uh, dealing with audio issues is almost my least favorite thing to do ever. I apologize uh, for the consistent occasional audio issues that we have. I detest audio engineering. Uh, and I have enough volume of content that I'm trying to do that I don't have a lot of time left over to try and uh, become a part-time audio engineer. So sometimes, often, I look at it and I go, you know what? It's understandable. It's good enough. It gets the information across. I am a one-man show, and uh, and that'll do. Uh, beyond that, the other thing that, that I don't enjoy about the job is scheduling. Um, I like traveling. I really don't like the coordination and the organization of trying to get trips set up, um, especially for, geez, especially for international trips. I am almost always visiting people that I haven't seen before and trying to coordinate in advance, like, here's what I need to have in order to film. You know, I need an area that's kind of quiet, an area that has good lighting. I need to be able to set up a table. And by the way, it's going to be several hours if I want to get any substantial amount of work done. Um, Getting an understanding of, of that sort of situation can be very difficult with people you've never met when you're just communicating via email, and then trying to coordinate multiple different things so that you end up with a trip where you don't have a lot of wasted time. It can be done. I've been I've had pretty good success at doing it so far, I think, but it's not the part of the job that I really enjoy the most. Uh, what I do enjoy is getting my hands on the interesting guns and learning new things and discovering things about unusual firearms that I didn't know before. So in that way, it really absolutely is a dream job. Um, and I'm very much in the debt of everybody out there who uh, makes this possible. Uh, let's see, next up, uh, Tom says, what collection would you really like to visit? And the answer for that, for me at this point, would be King Abdullah II of Jordan. Uh, I have it on good authority that, that he, or at least someone in his royal family, uh, is very much a gun person, and uh, takes a, a very great interest in a lot of unusual firearms, and unless I have that completely mistaken, I would love to be able to do some filming in the Jordanian Royal Firearms Collection. I can only imagine what sort of really interesting stuff is in there, um, and it would be a fascinating trip to take, um, fascinating place to visit, I think. And yeah, so if anyone out there, if any of you guys have any personal connections to the Jordanian royal family and, uh, and think it would be appropriate to suggest such a thing, I would love to come visit Jordan. Uh, next up, from Sleep, says, would something like the Davis gun fit into the Forgotten Weapons remit? Uh, if the Carl Gustav M42 did, perhaps it might. Yes, it absolutely would. This was an artillery sort of uh, World War I aircraft weapon, uh, the only thing I would need to have is a Davis gun. So a lot of that stuff, there's a lot of really weird stuff out there that has gotten some exposure thanks to the internet. Uh, you know, notable pictures of weird guns floating around. Almost all of that stuff would absolutely be viable, great content for forgotten weapons. It's just a matter of me actually getting my hands on it. So those are things I often can't really predict. Um, with the volume that I do and the 
the travel arrangements that I have to make. It's generally not feasible for me to make a trip specifically for one gun. I think the last time I did that was years ago for the Pancor Jackhammer, and that was actually a trip I was able to tack on to an existing trip. So for stuff like a Davis gun, it's got to end up being something that I'm able to find when I'm somewhere else uh, doing a bunch of other filming. So when it happens, absolutely, I'd love to take advantage of it and bring you those sorts of weird things, obviously. Uh, Jeffrey says, do you have any plans on doing a video or two on the Browning High Power in the near future, considering its history and that FN has finally decided to halt production of it? Yes, um, so I actually have a video on one of the very, very early, the very first pattern uh, Belgian military high powers. It hasn't uh, published yet. I actually have I have a fair number of videos that have been filmed and not published yet. That is uh, a, a critical resource for me in continuing to post as often as I do. Um, I have to maintain a backlog so that when I have a dry spell on going places and, and filming things, I have videos that I can post and, uh, and keep it up. Um, however, more importantly for the high power, I think the place to do that filming is going to be the Browning Museum in Ogden, Utah, where they have some of the very early developmental prototype high powers. And I plan, I would really like to get to that museum. I haven't had a chance to yet. You'd think it wouldn't be that hard because I'm in Arizona and they're just in Utah. Um, and here I am gallivanting around to places like South Africa and Finland. And it's all just a matter of, um, you know, what, what gets the most, the most interesting stuff for you guys in, in the scheduling that's allowed. So sooner or later I will get to the Ogden Museum and uh, we will definitely do some video, assuming the Ogden Museum people are cool with it, I haven't actually talked to them yet, <laughs> of uh, some really cool prototype high powers. Next up, uh, Hotrigel says, how were stripper, stripper and end block clips distributed in various armies in the World Wars? Could a soldier throw away a clip in a firefight and get replacements, or was he supposed to preserve them like magazines? Uh, almost entirely they were disposable. Um, ammunition generally was issued already in clips. Uh, with the French, of course, general reference I'm going to go to, uh, the French issued ammunition in like four different kinds of packaging. They issued just loose cartridges for guys with the label. They issued ammo in three round clips for the three round Berthiers. They issued ammo in five round clips once they introduced the five round Berthiers. And they actually issued ammo in the five round RSC clips as well for the guys who had those rifles. Um, in World War II, the US issued ammunition uh, loose in boxes for things like BARs. They issued, this is all 30 out 6 of course, uh, they issued it in five round stripper clips for Springfield rifles, which yes, the US still used extensively in World War II. They issued it in eight round and block clips for the M1 Garands. They issued it in belts uh, for the machine guns. There were some situations where guys got the wrong sort of ammo. Uh, Battle of the Bulge in particular, I believe there was a unit that had M1s and they managed to get an ammo resupply of ammo in five round Springfield clips. So in situations like that it would behoove you to have some clips lying around or to save them, but in general every time you got new ammo it was already in clips and so nobody ever made any real uh, effort to, to uh, keep or use stripper clips. For that thing, you'll notice with Mausers you can generally close the bolt and knock the clip out of the action as you close the bolt. That's how you do it. You don't care about that clip, just leave it on the ground. Uh, Henry says, what are the most beautiful and the ugliest firearms in your opinion? Um, most beautiful is a tricky one because there are a lot of potential contenders, but I think I'm going <laughs> to fulfill the stereotype here and I'm going to say the, uh, the 1902 Berthier, the Indochina Berthier. I think it's a very elegant rifle. I think the length is just right. I really like the kind of the swoop of the magazine. Um, in fact, hold on one moment. That is a 1902 Indochina Berthier. Um, it's got the brass tip cleaning rod, which I think is a really cool, interesting addition to it. Length is right, shape is right. I really like these. Uh, as for the ugliest, that should be an easy one. It is the Cobra Terminator. Thanks for bringing it back up again. I was trying not to think about that thing again. Uh, let's see. Joseph says, I left a comment ages ago about your, on your RSC 1918 video in which I asked if the three round clips would work in lieu of five rounders and you said you'd try it. The question is, have you yet? And if so, how did it work? Well, 
Um, at the time, when that comment was posted, I had already uh, left Canada, and I was no longer had a 1918 around. However, since then I have acquired an RSC 1918, and I did in fact try that, and they do work. In fact they work just fine. Now the downside is, of course, they only hold three rounds. Um, what I found with test firing my 1918 is all the problems that you saw us have uh, with the clips in the original video, where we were shooting the 1917 and the 18, those are all happening with my 1918 as well. So the five round Berthier clips work really quite nicely on the bolt action rifles, but they just don't seem to have the strength uh, to be sustainably used in the semi-autos. And as we just talked about, those are clips that weren't supposed to be reused, and at most they would be reused once. When you reused them once in the military, they were actually marked with a little X, so they wouldn't be reused again. Um, the clips just aren't reliably usable. I'd have to have a whole supply of new clips, which is how the French use them. However, I am getting to a point here, um, with three round clips there are guys in Australia who are manufacturing brand new three round Berthier clips, and they're made of a much better material, it's much stronger steel. Um, not sure if they heat treat it, or if it's just a little bit thicker, or just not so crappy. Um, those three round new production clips do seem to actually have the the toughness to function reliably in that RSC and not be destroyed uh, by the feeding process. So I can't really take the RSC out to do like competition shooting with three round clips, that would just suck too much. However, those Australian guys are presumably, according I asked them, they're planning to release five round reproduction clips sometime next spring. And I have high hopes that those clips will be as good as their threes, and that will finally give me a reliable feeding device for my 1918 carbine. Uh, Jonathan says, what are your thoughts on the 224 Valkyrie, and do you think it will withstand the test of time, or is it just the flavor of the month? I think it's just the flavor of the month. It's not to say it's a bad cartridge, it's a great cartridge. It's 6.8, I think, neck down to 2.23. Uh, you get a little less magazine capacity, but you get... Basically it gives you um, M193 velocity, like a nice high velocity, on a heavier projectile, and it does it by having a larger powder charge. Um, it's a fine cartridge. It is not such an advantage over existing 5.56 ammo that any military, I think, is going to be interested in converting to it. Um, and any ballistic advantage you get from it, unless you are just dedicated to hand loading, uh, you will immediately lose a lot more in economics, because I can go buy really good 5.56 really dirt cheap, and I cannot buy really good 224 Valkyrie. I can't buy any 224 Valkyrie for anything remotely as inexpensive as 5.56. Excuse me. Uh, Christopher says, given the US Marines are using the IAR, do you think that the end is nigh for belt-fed machine guns at the squad level, if not the platoon and company levels? Keep being awesome and thank you. Well, I'll try. Um, no, the belt-fed machine guns are not going anywhere. The difference between a magazine-fed squad automatic weapon and a belt-fed light machine gun are um, they're all compromises, they're all trade-offs, and neither one is actually better than the other, because everything about that question is circumstance-based. So. Um, I think we will see the US Army quite possibly go back to a belt-fed gun at some point, uh, or the US Marine Corps perhaps. Uh, other militaries will absolutely continue to choose belt-fed sometimes, and magazine-fed other times. So yeah, belt-fed's not going anywhere. Um, the, you just can't get the volume of fire out of a magazine-fed gun that you can out of a belt-fed gun. That's what it comes down to. Colin says, why were semi-automatic pistols so far ahead of rifles in terms of widespread military adoption? Is it that much more difficult to design a reliable semi-auto rifle, or were there other factors that got in the way? Yes, it actually is that much more difficult because of the cartridge, or the cartridges, that people were using in those rifles. What everyone was looking for was a military semi-automatic rifle, because that's where everyone figured the money and the glory was going to be. Get your, get your new, you know, Super Blaster 1900 adopted by the German army, or the French army, or the Austrian army, or one of these big continental uh, military forces, and then you'll make a ton of money because they're going to buy hundreds of thousands of rifles. 
However, in order to interest those militaries you had to produce a rifle that was firing basically the same cartridge that they were currently using in their bolt actions. That cartridge may have been way more powerful than was actually practical or necessary, but you're not going to convince any army of that in 1900. They, you know, if, if we've got a 30 6 caliber Springfield 1903, we're going to want a 30-06 caliber semi-automatic rifle too. Which is in fact exactly what the US adopted. So um, the difference here is firing that, safely containing that amount of pressure in a rifle cartridge requires a much more sophisticated and stronger locking system than the pistol cartridges that were being used in pistols. Um, a lot of those pistols could be just simple blowback, got a little bit of bolt weight and a little bit of spring, and that's all you need to safely contain the cartridge. That's not happening with an 8mm Mauser or a 7.62x54. So it, that's why it took people longer to design effective rifles. You'll notice that machine guns, uh, light machine guns, heavy machine guns, those came out really at the same time as pistols. Maxim was developing machine guns even before smokeless powder was, was developed. But he was able to do that because he, he was able to have a lot more weight in the gun. A shoulder rifle, as a practical matter, is really limited to 10 or 12 pounds. Beyond that, it's going to be too impractical for guys to carry around. Uh, so you had the, the challenge was you have to design a very strong rifle, but it has to be relatively lightweight. It can't be that much heavier than one of these bolt action rifles. So therein lies the additional difficulty. Uh, next up, Ryan says, have you ever traded in multiple firearms or other hobby related items to buy a dream firearm? What were they and did you later regret it? Um, not really. I don't sell a lot of guns. Um, I've not really been in the position of like sell one in order to buy another. However, I've had a lot of, well not a lot, I've had a number of times when um, when I had set my mind on a dream gun and I'm like, that's the one, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be perfect, it's gonna do everything, it'll be awesome, and I would scrimp and save and put aside everything to get that gun. And it usually has ended up being disappointing. So I remember one of the first guns I got, uh, boy, like the first gun I got when I was in college, I did a whole bunch of reading on the internet. <clears throat> I figured out exactly what is the ideal battle rifle, and that's what I need. And it was, I ended up uh, picking a, uh, a 308 Vepper. And this was the one where it's, the, at this point, they still had the, the wooden thumbhole stocks. But according to the internet, this was going to be the perfect gun, as far as I could tell. I'd never, I'd ne I think I'd handled them. I'd never fired one. I'd never fired much of the, many of the other guns in that sort of class. Um, but, you know, this thing had, you could mount a scope on it so you could get the accuracy, but it had the AK reliability and it had detachable box, blah, 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 blah. It ended up kind of sucking at everything that I wanted to do with it. Um, and I've had that happen other times. So what I've come to the conclusion of instead is don't ever, if you decide that something is the gun that you really must have, you'd better have at least shot it first. Find one that someone else owns, borrow one, rent one somewhere. There are, rental gun ranges are not, you know, maybe few and far between in some places and what they stock will be limited, but find a buddy, go, you know, join a gun club, find someone who's got whatever it is that you think is the ultimate perfect gun and try it out first. And then if you still think it's great, absolutely buy it and, and you'll have a great gun. But you don't always have the information available to make that kind of decision just from reading stuff. So it's been a little bit different uh, in terms of collecting. You know, you can figure out like what is the dream gun for your collection from reading, because generally speaking that, you know, the, the collector's dream gun doesn't really rely much on handling and shooting. It's all about the gun's history and mechanics, and you can learn all that online. Um, but there's no substitute for actually shooting a gun if you want to know how the gun shoots. That maybe should be obvious, but I don't think it always is. It certainly wasn't for me. Uh, let's see, Gory the All-Powerful says, how would you rank uh, the US in terms of its small arms during the Second World War? It's often stated that the Americans were mostly behind other countries that fought in the war, but is this really the case? Um, not everything we had was the greatest, not everything was the worst, not by a long shot. Um, what I would say is there wasn't really any one standout country in terms of small arms in general. 
I would say each, there was one country that had the best of each sort of category. And when it comes to the infantry shoulder rifle, I think the US absolutely crushed everyone else. The M1 Garand was, in my mind, without a doubt, the best service rifle of World War II. However, the Browning 30 wasn't the best machine gun. The BAR was definitely not the best light machine gun. Um, I would say the best light machine gun was the Bren, uh, run by the British. I'd say the best submachine guns were the Soviet, the PPSH-41 and the PPS-43. Um, you know, the British Sten guns were terrible. Uh, the US Thompson is terrible for other reasons, or at least not great for other reasons. The MP40 is has its pros and cons, but ultimately to me it's kind of eh. I think the Soviets nailed the submachine guns. Um, machine, as for general purpose machine guns, unquestioningly the Germans had the best one. The MG34 and 42, just the, those guns were as good relative to their competitors as the M1 was to its competitors. So the British Vickers, the American Browning 30s, um, the Soviet uh, Maxim guns and SG43s, none of those things really could be anywhere near as good as the German 34 and 42. So overall, I think most of the powers were fairly close in, in their small arms when you average everything together. In the US, I wouldn't say was way ahead of the bunch, but we also weren't way behind the bunch either. Uh, Samuel says, I am negotiating the purchase of a Swedish Mauser among some potential rifles being considered for sale from a collection. In the case of serialized military bolt actions, the prevailing gunsmith advice I have been given is first to verify if the bolt and the rifle serial numbers match. If so, given a decent bore, the advice that is that the rifle should be safe to shoot. The concern seems to be over headspace. I partially understand this advice, but given that most of these rifles were made with interchangeable parts in a factory setting, would this not seem to matter? What are your thoughts on, uh, on this need to have a matching bolt? Um, I think there's a little bit of a, a miscommunication going on there. So everything you say here is true. Um, and I will also add that having a matching bolt is very desirable from a collector's point of view. So if you want a historical rifle for its history, you, if at all possible, you want the bolt to be matching. You want everything to be matching, but the bolt's the most important factor. Now that also will impact headspace. Um, many rifles, and I'm sure the Swedish Mausers are among them, although I can't say I've ever specifically looked, a great many rifles you can swap the bolts back and forth and it doesn't matter. Um, they will headspace. However, you also have to consider the wear that the individual rifle has been through, because a matching numbered bolt does not guarantee that the headspace will be acceptable. I have seen, I have seen matching guns fail headspace checks, and the reason is when they have been heavily worn. Um, you, if you erode away the front of the chamber, uh, or you fire the gun enough that the locking lugs start to kind of set back, uh, you absolutely can have a gun that will be out of headspace. So the, the safest thing is, in fact, the only thing that I will recommend in public and on video is always check headspace on a military surplus firearm before you fire it, whether it's got a, a, matching, uh, a matching numbered bolt or not. Um, there will be other people who will have different advice, but I'm not willing to give any different advice in a situation where I might be looking at the liability of uh, someone not properly understanding or interpreting or not properly judging the condition of a rifle that they have. Sorry. Uh, Neto. Sorry, it's getting really quite toasty in here because I'm in Arizona. I have the air conditioning off to improve the audio as much as I hate dealing with audio as previously discussed, and I believe it's 108 degrees outside. So uh, we have about a page left, and uh, we're going to wrap these up. Anyway, uh, Neto says, do you have a particular weapon that by all accounts was not that great or successful, but you really enjoy anyway? Yes. I'll be right back. This one. I love this thing. This is my 30 out 6 caliber M1918 registered and full auto Shosha machine rifle. And it is a terrible gun by all objective measures. Well, it's not a really good design, but it works better than anyone including myself ever thought that it would, and I just really enjoy shooting it. I don't mind that the recoil is massive and the gun is as close to uncontrollable as any machine gun I've ever really fired, but I think the history is great and I love playing with guns that are unorthodox that everybody thinks suck. Um, 
and actually making them run as well as I possibly can. This is the sort of gun that I fully intend, I will, take to a two-gun match. I will very likely come in in the bottom five, and I will have a great time doing it. All right, next question is Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan has two questions. So first, was there a particular reason why at the advent of smokeless powder most countries standardized on a caliber around 7 to 8 millimeters? I know the French pioneered the way with the 8 millimeter Lebel. Was that fact alone what influenced further countries to use similar sizes? Uh, no, I think what you see is actually physics. It kind of sets that. And it wouldn't be so much 7 to 8, it's like 6.5 to 8 millimeter. And so at the small end, um, you need, if you go much below six and a half millimeter, you don't have enough bullet weight uh, to be to do the things that a military cartridge needs to do. To have um, the the range, uh, to be able to maintain energy. Remember, this is what they were trying to do at you know 1880s, 1890s. You know, we use five five six today because our standards have changed. We don't expect the same level of ballistic performance out of a rifle cartridge that they did back then. And below like six and a half millimeter, you just can't do it, not enough bullet weight. When you get above about eight millimeter, now in order to have a bullet long enough to have a good ballistic coefficient, that, well, in order to have a have the right ballistic coefficient, that bullet's got to be relatively long. And if you've got a bullet that's that long, and also nine or ten or eleven millimeters in diameter, it becomes a really heavy bullet. Um, look at, you know, 50 BMG, that's 11, well that's 12.7 millimeter, which is not quite out of line for early black powder rifles, but it's a 700 grain bullet, and you want to throw that thing at smokeless powder velocities of 25, 24, 25, 26, 2800 feet per second, you're talking about a tremendous amount of recoil. So you get above 8 millimeter, all of a sudden the gun gets really difficult to shoot well just because of recoil. So you end up naturally falling into this range between six and a half and about eight. Uh, Jonathan's second question is, why were tube magazines and the lever action system so common in earlier rifles? From what I have seen, bolt action started with early needle guns, and box magazines uh, only came to following the label, so there must have been some reason. Um, part of it is simply box magazines weren't invented first. No one came up with that idea until Lee in like the 18, yeah, well it was 18, late 1870s when the box magazine was first developed. However, remember at this point we're talking about the older black powder cartridges, and they're generally quite large in diameter, they have big extra rims. These are features that don't make them necessarily conducive to a box magazine. If you take a 4570, you're not really going to be making a double stack 4570 magazine. And the early Lees weren't. They were single stack magazines, and you'd hold four or five rounds in a magazine. Well, if you put a tube under the barrel, you can get eight or nine in, into the same length of gun that you've already got, um, trying to make an eight or nine round box, single stack box magazine for 4570, or 43 Spanish, or 11 millimeter Mauser. That's going to be a, a pretty long magazine, and it's going to interfere with things like shooting prone. Um, when you have the, the old black powder cartridges, the noses are round. Um, the, the rims don't interfere. In fact, the rims make it nice and easy to feed those, gun, those cartridges from a tube magazine. That rim makes a really good thing that you can catch and then release and catch and release uh, to, to regulate feeding, where it's a hindrance in a box magazine. So. Two magazines really are the better solution for those cartridges. And then what you would see is, as those cartridges become replaced by rimless, smaller diameter smokeless rifles with pointed bullets, now smokeless cartridges with pointed bullets, now the box magazine starts to become the much better solution. Uh, let's see, Kevin says, I received an email from Gunbroker stating that pre-orders were being accepted for a semi-automatic version of the AA-12 shotgun. Any insight into this, or plans to do a video, etc. I wonder if it's vaporware. Um, I also saw that. I would love to do a video on one. I would love to have them send me one to do a video on. I'm not planning to buy one, probably. Um, but mostly because shotguns, and especially new shotguns, aren't really my interest. Um, I would absolutely like to do a video on an original full-auto AA-12 as well. That's on my list. It's in fact kind of on the higher tier of like stuff I really want to find at some point to film for you guys. A semi-auto one would be neat. Um, that said, I have a policy of 
I do not put paint. I do not make <coughs> that being said, I have a standard policy at this point of I do not pay for rifles in advance, or I don't pay for guns in advance of when they're ready. Um, I'm not going to pre-order a gun. It, there's, there's always a, a great temptation to do it, like, oh, I don't want to get left behind. The, the reality is, if it's a gun that is worth owning, it will be available to purchase once it's actually made. So it's not like they're going to make a hundred, and then that'll be it, and it, you know, it's a great gun, and then they only make a hundred. Because if it's a great gun, there will be demand for it, and they will make more than a hundred. If it's a crappy gun, then maybe that's the reason they're only making a hundred total. Um, there are a few exceptions to this, um, mostly things like semi-automatic conversions of machine guns, where they're not actually making the new gun, where they're making, you know, they're using parts kits and, and then adding a few American-made parts, like a new receiver, new fire control parts. And in those situations, sure, the, the limiting supply of parts kits may very well limit the number of guns that be, are made. And, and in that case, maybe there's an argument to make a pre-order, but other than something like that, something like this AA-12, thanks. Um, I'll wait till they're around, and if they look like they're good, and, and I want one, then I'll purchase one when I can send the money and have a gun shipped. Uh, Jordan says, what does an average day in the life of Ian look like, either traveling or at home? Well, traveling there is no average day, because it's always different. Just depends where I am and what I'm doing. As for a normal day at home, um, well, I get up. Actually, the first thing I do after I get up is work out, um, have a little home gym, a little tiny home gym that uh, we set up, and we either work there or go running in the morning. Um, I alternate three and a half Ks and five Ks. It's not a super lot of distance, but it helps keep me in shape for uh, trying to not fall too far behind Carl in two gun matches. Um, grab some breakfast, and then pretty much go right to work. Work could be editing video, it could be sitting in the library like I am right now filming video, uh, it could be researching guns. Uh, every time I go on a trip, if I'm going to Rock Island or the Morphe's Auction House, or traveling to a museum or other collection, I always try to have my research done in advance so that I know what I'm going to be able to talk about on the guns that I'm going to see. Uh, travel gets a lot more difficult when it's like, surprise, you don't know what you're going to be filming. It's a mystery trip. Um, that gets tricky. I prefer to know in advance what I'm going to be filming so that I can put together some notes and at least know the basic history, um, or, or have refreshed it, have it nice and fresh in my head. Um, so I could be doing that. Um, as I discussed, boy, an hour ago in this video, I think, uh, I am a one-man show, so I also uh, intermittently through the day, I'll be spending some time on social media, I'll be answering emails, I'll be corresponding with people. Um, lunch at about 11.30, dinner at... Eh. My schedule fluctuates a bit depending on season, so here in Arizona, uh, currently in the middle of the day, it's like 108 degrees outside, I'm not going to go running at, say, 9 in the morning when it's already 100, so I get up pretty early, you know, I'll probably get up at about 5 in the morning in the summer, uh, and then have dinner at 5.30, go to bed by like 8. Uh, when we transition to the winter, we shift that whole schedule a couple hours. Uh, yeah, go to bed at 10, get up at 7 or 8. So that's, that's pretty much my typical day. Some of the days will involve going out to the range instead. Sometimes uh, you know, off to film something with Carl for in-range, sometimes off to shoot a match. There is a fair amount of variety to it. When I'm in the office, it's filming, Editing, social media, pretty much. All right, next question is from Jacob, and Jacob has a question about artillery, basically. And I was going to delete this question because I really don't know the answer to it. And then I thought to myself, I do know someone who knows the answer, and that would be Bob Begondo. Uh, you will recognize Bob uh, from a number of artillery videos that I have done, most notably the uh, German Pac-40, 75mm anti-tank gun. Uh, where there is a nice still frame in the video of him with a firing lanyard in one hand, a gigantic fireball in front of him, and all of his hair blown out like this. Um, Bob does all sorts of awesome artillery stuff. 
uh, he works for Hamilton Firearms um, out of Cottonwood, Arizona. And so I figured I'd ask him to answer this question. Hi, my name is uh, Bob Bagando, and I work out of Hamilton and Sun Firearms in Cottonwood, Arizona, where we specialize in destructive devices. You guys have probably seen my long hippie hair floating around and a lot of the other destructive device large gun videos on YouTube. I'm gonna see if I can ha answer a question from you guys, uh, for you guys. Question comes from Jacob, who asks, Still have a question on how the larger caliber cannons like 88s and 105s got into the country after World War II. Were these larger machine guns and destructive devices once imported before 68 or were they all rebuilt from parts kits? Unclear how the war surplus was handled once the war machines were parked. And, and yes, both. Um, a lot of the guns that are in the country currently right now have been to get put together from various parts kits. Um, sometimes it takes three guns to put one good gun together. Um, however, prior to 68, um, a lot of these guns were imported, um, some by individuals. I had the opportunity to work on a beautiful British two-pounder, um, and it was imported by an individual, and it was amnesty registered prior to 68. Um, another company called uh, Service Armament, uh, owner of Val Forget, um, was a major player of the game and he brought in lots and lots of cannons. Some of the old uh, catalogs from Service Armaments um, had a lot of the Bofors guns and the Pateau guns and the Hotchkiss guns and the Rheinmetall guns listed for sale. Um, they're really neat catalogs because you can see the ammunition, the guns, and everything was very reasonably priced by our standards today. Um, I know another guy by the name of Dangerous Dave out of California um, is responsible for a lot of the Krupp guns uh, that are in the country. Um, and I'm sure there are other um, companies that well, as well that brought them in prior to 68. As far as the 88s go, um, the big guns like the 88s, we don't see a lot of them over here. In fact, I only know of one um, that is firing right now, and I believe it was brought over by an individual prior to 68. Uh, 105s are a little bit more common because they're a United States gun, and a lot of the ones that weren't used were donated to various private museums, um, non-private museums, war memorials, and one way or another legally um, appeared in civilian hands and are, are floating around out there. So the answer to your question is that yes, there were guys before us that are doing the same things that we do as far as they were off searching for cool guns and bringing them back over here. Uh, I think it was a little bit easier uh, prior to 68, so we saw a lot more stuff come in. Uh, anyway, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you very much. So there you go. Uh, thanks to Bob. Uh, that was a really cool answer. And again, that's a subject I don't know so much about. So uh, I very much appreciate getting his input. If you need artillery, by the way, I do somewhat regularly get emails from people asking things like, hey, where can I get 25 millimeter Puteau ammunition? Or where can I get this cannon round or that cannon round? Bob is my go-to source for that sort of stuff. So if you need something like that, um, check him out um, at Hamilton Firearms. I think YouTube's current policies are not going to allow me to put a link there, but uh, Hamilton Firearms, I'm sure you can Google it and find it. Uh, Philip is our next question. Philip says, would you be kind enough to make a list on your website of the different books that you would recommend for us to take a look at when it comes to firearms? Maybe categorize them into historical and mechanical content types. I'm mostly after books that are on the mechanical side of firearms. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Philip. At some point I will do that. Um, I have some quasi-vague plans, but things I really do want to get moving on putting some more content back on the website, on ForgottenWeapons.com, more than just video. Uh, that will require bringing in some other people. I've got some plans there. One of the things I would like to do is have a much better library reference section on the website. So I can't give you any guarantees as to when exactly that's going to happen, but it is something that is in the planning. So cross your fingers, hopefully we'll have that sooner rather than later. Uh, Cody says, if the world powers during World War II had their greatest weapons to fight the war with at the beginning of the war, do you think the Allies would have had a harder time defeating the Axis powers? For example, if the Germans fielded the Sturmgewehr 44 at the beginning of the war. Yes, it would have been harder. No, I don't think it would have made an ultimate difference. Um, the things that won World War II 
were logistics and supply, and not so much individual small arms. Um, so this this question has come up a number of times. Um, it probably would have extended the war. You know, if the Germans had adopted the the Sturmgewehr earlier and really put it into production and managed to make enough ammunition for it as well, could the war have gone into 1946? Yeah, it, it's entirely possible. But the Russians still would have won on the Eastern Front, and that would be the end of that. Teddy uh, says, Old weapons that have survived to this day and age come in a huge variety of conditions, often depending on their material, or their finish, or their storage condition. Given modern manufacturing methods and materials, how do you predict modern firearms, like Glock and Scar, will age as future decades and centuries pass? I think they will age better than the old stuff. Um, I think all of our finishes today are generally better than what we had 100 or 200 or 500 years ago. Um, there will be some... not everything will not last perfectly. Storage conditions are huge, you know, even... you take even the best gun today and you leave it sitting where it's going to get like regularly doused in salt water, or even just in a humid environment, um, and it will suffer over time. But um, all of our materials are better, all of our finishes are better, I think polymers are going to last better than wood in many cases. I think we've gotten past the point now of polymers that aren't going to age well, like some of the early Bakelites and, and early plastics, um, or, or molded grip components, materials that shrunk over time. I think we're past that. I think. You take care of it today, and a modern gun is going to last hundreds of years. <coughs> uh, Chuck says, why did the 41 Action Express not succeed? It was just as good as the 40 Smith & Wesson, and the conversion from a 9mm pistol was, pistol was trivial. Well, you hit half of it right there. It was just as good as the 40 Smith & Wesson, and the corollary is the 40 Smith & Wesson was kind of just as good as the 41 AE. Now, the 41 was a little bit more powerful, it did have more options for it. I think, now I don't have any actual, like, special insight into why the 40 beat the 41, and in some ways this is like a VHS versus Betamax sort of thing. Um, my hypothesis, entirely devoid of actual factual support, would be that uh, this decision was largely driven by police, um, that Smith & Wesson was a very reliable supplier of police arms, where the 41 Action Express was being developed by some civilians and some import sort of companies and some foreign companies, and it didn't look as good to modern, you know, to American police agencies. Like, you could buy a, a 40 Smith & Wesson from Smith & Wesson, uh, whom you've been getting police guns from for like 150 years, or you could buy a 41 Action Express from Tanfoglio, and they're going to go with Smith & Wesson. Uh, and then a lot of this is the sort of sort of issue where once one starts to become successful, it gets more successful, and the one that starts off kind of slipping, just it will never recover. It's a vicious cycle um, in both directions. So, uh, in theory, yes, the rebated rim of the forty-one makes it an easier conversion. But I think a lot of a lot of these a lot of the market for these pistols weren't conversions. There aren't actually a whole lot of people who are all that interested in conversions. Because, like, okay, I can convert my 9mm to 41 Action Express, and have less capacity, and pay more for ammo. Well, I'm probably going to think about that if I'm the potential individual civilian buyer, and go, you know what? 9mm is easier to shoot, and it's cheaper, and I kind of like it. I'll just stick with that. And for police agencies, they don't care about converting. They're going to buy new guns. So it really doesn't matter to them, they're never going to convert the guns between different calibers anyway. So so that's not an advantage for the 41. So those are my hypotheses. I do not guarantee any of them to be correct. I would be interested to hear from someone who had more of a personal involvement and a first-hand view of that adoption question. And our very last question here is one more question from Sleep. Uh, who says, there are a few early examples of magazines in buttstocks, but generally modern firearms have the magazine perpendicular to the barrel and adjacent to the action. Are there any existing designs where the magazine is behind the action, and which work? There's only one that I can really come up with, and that was the Steyr ACR, uh, where the magazine is very much behind the action. Um, apparently those things, well they did work, they didn't work well enough to actually be adopted. Um, there is that Russian uh, Kobarov TK-043, I think it is, 
um, that has a magazine, it's a bullpup thing, it has a magazine way at the very back of the action. I'd love to get my hands on one of those. I suspect it didn't work all that well. Certainly, like the Steyr ACR, it didn't work well enough to get adopted. Um, beyond that, not a whole lot. And the reason is generally that with a box magazine you have to have something to push the bolt forward, and the bolt has to be traveling the whole length of the cartridge in order to eject the empty case. And so by far the most practical way to design the gun is to have the bolt face pick up the cartridge on its forward stroke. So um, the, the, the buttstock magazine systems that you saw in a lot of black powder rifles like the Winchester Hotchkiss and the Evans uh, just isn't mechanically practical uh, for a modern box magazine sort of thing. So that is five pages of questions. I am getting hot and sweaty here because 108 degrees outside. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching, especially if you're still watching now. Um, and if you would like to get a question in yourself for next month's Q&A, uh, that is open to patrons at the $2 level and up. Uh, there is a link in the description text below to patreon.com where you can sign up and help personally make sure that Forgotten Weapons never stops happening. Um, also, if you did submit a question and I didn't answer it, I apologize. I get like eight times as many questions as I can actually answer in a given session before my voice completely goes out. So uh, there are lots of good questions that I'm just not able to get to. Uh, if you really think yours, damn it, should have been answered, uh, go ahead and submit it again next month. I do try to keep an eye out for repeats and make sure to get them in. Thanks very much for watching.